Welcome to Opalis TV. Today I'm in Zurich together with Joe Tausig. Joe is the founder and the chief executive officer of Tausig Capital. Joe has been working for over 20 years setting up banks and reinsurance companies, starting in Bermuda. Joe, over the last years I have seen that a couple of very prominent hedge fund managers like David Einhorn, uh, Steve Cohn from SAC Capital, and Dan Loeb from Third Point, they set up reinsurance companies. Why do they do that? And are these real insurance companies? We've identified 14 managers that have set up uh, large companies. The 14 are all recognizable. One of them amazed us. We've found four companies that Soros has bankrolled over the years. And and it may be more, but you know, it uh, takes a little bit of digging. But of the 14 managers we've found, we've been involved with four of them. The primary reason these have uh, been set up is that they're virtual certainty to outperform the funds of the managers. The, the original model is really Buffett. And we did a study on Buffett a couple of years ago, and we came to the conclusion if he stayed a fund manager, the value of Berkshire Hathaway would be somewhat less than 5% of what it is today. AQR did a paper separate from us and came to a similar conclusion that Buffett gets much more of his alpha from the fact he operates within the framework of an insurance or reinsurance business than he does from just stock picking. And uh, Einhorn, Loeb, Cohen, Paulson, AQR have all set up reinsurance companies and the primary motivation is that they can outperform the uh, funds and they offer that to their, their investors. Investors get a couple of other things that uh, benefit them. If it gets publicly traded like uh, Greenlight or Berkshire are, they get daily liquidity. Greenlight trades about $4 million worth of shares a day. Greenlight trades at a premium to book value, so you not only compound at higher ROEs because of the business than the fund would, but you get the premium to book value and daily liquidity. There are some tax benefits, but they're somewhat tertiary. If you look at the history of Greenlight, when they set it up, there were no taxable investors. So everybody in it was because it had better returns. If you look at it for a taxable investor who came into Greenlight after it went public, the tax benefits seem to be about 10 to 15% of the difference, but the major difference is just outperformance and premium to book value. Joe, how is it possible that within such a reinsurance framework, a fund manager can actually outperform his own flagship fund? When you put money in a fund, it works one time. It's in at NEV, it compounds, comes out at NEV. When you put money, the same amount of investment in a reinsurance company, it works twice. At the equity level, it behaves like a fund investment. So if you broke even operationally, you'd have the same returns as the fund. But it also allows you to take in premiums and, and generate operating profits. In America, two million people go to work every day in the insurance business and they generate 10 points of ROE from operations. So the idea is for the reinsurance company to capture some of that 10 points of ROE and you get the returns uh, of the fund plus the operating profits. And it's pretty hard to mess it up as long as you stay out of catastrophic risks. So tell us more about the operational activities of these reinsurance vehicles that are run by hedge fund managers and what are the type of businesses and transactions they engage in on the operational level? Well, first of all, they're generally reinsurance companies. Uh, insurance businesses have lots of moving parts, lots of salespeople, a lot of paper processing, etc. Well, reinsurance companies are basically like wholesalers doesn't need nearly as many people to operate and to do the business and things are done kind of in bulk. There are generally two types of reinsurance. One is uh, where the insurance company can't face the magnitude of losses in a catastrophic situation. The other kind is where they want to use their capital more efficiently. The an insurance company is limited to how much business can do by its capital. So if it can lay off some of its reserves without 
and, and, and redeploy its capital and do more business that's profitable, they increase their overall operating margins. That's called frequency business. So Greenlight's got a mix of, of severity business, it's relatively small, and it's mostly frequency business. Third point is, is starting out more in the frequency business where SAC is in the, more in the severity business. And Paulson's in the severity business and AQR's in the severity business. The way they, they manage risk in the severity business is has a, have a portfolio of risks. In other words, if you're insuring earthquakes in Japan and hurricanes in Florida or tornadoes in the Midwest, the likelihood of those being correlated is pretty minimal. And by collecting a portfolio of those kind of risks, they can, can uh, generate the operating profits. This, the frequency business depends much more on, on investment strategy uh, for operating profits than, than underwriting profits. should be noted that the insurance industry at large basically has an underwriting loss. The, if you think of underwriting profits or losses as a cost of funds, Buffett calls it the float. Buffett today, people he, he brags that people pay him to take the, the risk. In other words, he has an underwriting profit. But for the first 40 years of his history, he had underwriting losses. And his cost of funding was about 2% a year but it's very stable and it's not subject to margin calls and people supplying and changing the terms, you know, on a whim like a margin loan is. So anyway, to answer your question again, yes, these are real reinsurance companies. They have real staff. They compete with the Swiss Re's of the world for, for the business, but the investment returns are significantly greater in these companies than a Swiss Re. Swiss Re, I think, earned 2% on assets last year. And that won't cover the historic cost of funding from the, the reinsurance businesses, which is usually about a 3% per year cost. We talked about the benefits that investors have when they go into a reinsurance company that a hedge fund manager has set up. Now, for the hedge fund manager himself, why should he do that? I like to think a number of them are motivated because they're passionate about delivering the best risk-adjusted returns that they can with the skills they have. But after all, most hedge fund managers are the largest investors in their funds. So if they could get better returns on their own capital and provide better returns for their investors, well, that certainly is a strong motivation. I, I, secondarily, it becomes permanent capital. If you compare Tiger and Berkshire, in the early 2000s, identical investment strategies, but the hedge fund structure is very unstable. So for every point of drawdown, there's about two points of redemptions, and it requires the manager to, to sell into falling markets, if you would, exacerbating the spiral of, of further losses, redemptions, etc. And eventually, the, you, there's not enough the high water mark uh, basically kills the ability to retain staff or recruit new staff, and the largest hedge fund in the world goes out of business. Whereas Berkshire Hathaway it was permanent capital. You, if you were unhappy with Berkshire, you just sold your stock, and Warren didn't have to delever or do anything because uh, he had permanent capital. Second thing is these uh, generate assets from sources you can't otherwise acquire assets. So reinsurance premiums are assets to manage. You wouldn't get unless you were in the insurance or reinsurance business. In the case of Third Point, I think they raised almost 400 million from private equity firms, none of which would invest in uh, Dan's funds, but they would invest in a reinsurance company that Dan would manage the assets for. If you look at Greenlight's uh, shareholders, they include mutual funds lots of pensions and endowments that may have investment restrictions or have problems investing in hedge funds because of their tax status or ERISA problems. 
uh, individuals don't qualify or the 99 investor rule limits individuals. So you have access to investors or sources of, of assets to manage that just wouldn't happen otherwise. So I wonder, Joe, why haven't more managers done this? Well, it's a good question. First of all, it's really hard to set one up, harder than it looks. And there are a couple of, of, of structural issues. If you want to raise capital from new sources, there's a feeling that you need to have your management team in place to do it. And most uh, executives in the business don't want to leave the uh, safety of a job for the uncertainty of a capital raise. So quite often, the, the two things, the, the sponsor has to target a very large amount of money, maybe 500 to a billion dollars, and give uh, guarantees. Uh, it's our understanding that Max Re, which was not one of our companies, gave $25 million worth of guarantees to the management team. So if it never launched, Mr. Bacon was going to be out $25 million. We've seen numerous times where the target is so high that they don't quite get there and there's a lot of backfilling to keep the group together, the investors together, and have to give up substantial uh, concessions to anchor investors to keep them on board. Uh, we have many, 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 many more man months and many, many, many more projects that fail to launch that have successfully launched. Since most of those managers are still in business, you, you don't read about the failures. No, we don't call you up at Opal Esk and say, listen, we worked for a year, year and a half on this and it didn't work. But I can give you two that are no longer in business and they're illustrative. We spent over a year with Pequot on a very large project when they decided to go out of business for reasons unrelated to the project. I like to think if we'd gotten it off the ground, Pequot would still be in business today. We also uh, helped uh, Fairfield Greenwich Group buy a Swiss bank. And of course, once the Madoff thing happened, it, everything unwound again. And both of those projects were well over a year. Most of these projects take 18 months to two years to launch and take internal resources, divert them from the primary business, which is asset management. Very high bar, minimum capital, require big investments from the principals, usually 50 to over 100 million. And a lot of guarantees and sifting through lines of business and, and, and management teams. So we've come up with an alternative. So that's probably a reason why the reinsurers that are set up now by hedge fund managers are coming out of hedge fund operations that are already substantially large and have a substantial track record, right? Now that's correct. And we've wrestled with this problem for a number of years. And what we've decided to do is to create our own reinsurance company. So it's our staff, our operations and it permits each sponsor to establish their own company where they manage the assets. There's no commingling of the assets or anything else. And we essentially are acting like a master reinsurer and we bring in the business and then we reallocate it, if you would, to all the participants pr proportionate to their capital, more or less. So we just launched this business this year. We have three managers on, and interestingly enough, one manages about 50 million, one manages 8 billion, one manages about 100 million. And most of these things take a million dollars to launch, most of which is goes to lawyers for private place memorandums so you can raise capital from new investors. And we basically have made that investment ourselves. And so we can essentially cut and paste the investment strategy into the document describing the insurance business, the risks, the regulatory environment, everything else. And that's a deliverable. So we caught, cut the cost of startup about 90%. We cut the fixed costs by 90 some percent because we're, we're operating it and we get paid totally on variable on a performance basis. So the fixed costs are basically auditors, uh, things that have to be independent of us, uh, law firms doing you know, normal corporate secretarial work, that kind of thing. On this uh, platform, because we're operating the reinsurance business, they can get up and running and 
60, 90 days. Startup costs are 100 versus a million. The manager doesn't have to make a very large commitment because the P&L recovers the startup costs and the frictional costs at about 2 million of capital instead of 500 million. And fixed costs of about 100,000 versus 3 to 5 million. And the idea is that the manager can learn by doing. Most of these guys had to study it forever, trying to figure out every nuance, and most of them still miss nuances about the business. And this way, once they get comfortable with the business and how it works, then we'll help them get a management team and uh, help them go to the capital markets and raise public equity capital and go on their own. They can stay part of the program if they like what we do but they don't have to, and they can even hire our staff. Some of our staff are involved because they want to become the next CEO of the next Greenlight Capital Re. Now, from the manager's perspective, are there any requirements or restrictions regarding size or track record or strategy? Well, certainly, um, strategy matters because you have to earn a return on the float, as Buffett calls it, in excess of the cost of insurance. So if you can net 3% per year on, let's say, a rolling five-year period of time consistently, net of fees and expenses, then you should outperform. Some strategies lend themselves better than others because liabilities have to be secured by letters of credit. So those that are more liquid with price transparency are tend to tend to work better but we've uh, done four over the years with funds of funds which is the least liquid least transparent and we're able we were able to secure letters of credit and and operate the businesses the obviously the better known the manager it is and the easier it is to raise money from from new investors who don't know the manager. I mean, that's one of the things the managers would like to use this as a tool to do. And that's somewhat tied to how much the manager personally commits and how much his existing investors commit. It helps raise money from people that don't know them new into company. the new company, yes. Put yourself in a position of an investor you know, the, the manager's got a lot of upside for the extra fees that he's got, he or she's going to generate, but he's not putting a lot of his own money in. That kind of doesn't feel good. And the investors that know him well aren't bringing money along. Remember, an investor gives up redemption rights, but gains better returns. And there's always a trade-off on because it becomes permanent capital. So if a manager gets an investor to convert, that investor is never going to redeem again. One of the things you have to do is have a covenant to go to the, the capital markets, either a 144A offering or a, an IPO as soon as possible. So Greenlight's commitment was to try to do it within three years, and they did it within two years and nine months. And, but this is a funny business that you can take public as a startup. There have been eight Bermuda startups that raised money in the IPO markets or the 144A markets as startups. And the total for the eight was $4 billion and the smallest is two fifty. So if the story is strong enough, the capital markets will provide capital. Five of those were IPOs, three of them were 144As, and we've been involved in, in uh, three of those transactions uh, over the years. Only uh, one of those was hedge fund related though, or asset management related. So it, it's, uh, it's kind of how does the story hang together? Now, if the manager, his funds and or his investors, plus new money outside gets to 20, 50, 100, or 250 million, you can probably get a, an investment bank to raise money from the public markets, uh, a like amount of money in less than a year's time if you can get to that critical mass. And we're pretty good at placing the securities. If there's enough from the manager and his investors, we can find other investors for them usually and hopefully get to this what we'll call critical mass.
You know, one of the subtleties is, is that most European managers don't have U.S. assets. And this is a shame because the 60% of all assets in the alternative space come out of the United States. And they look at it as very daunting from a regulatory and structuring standpoint to access those markets by setting up funds and becoming a registered investment advisor and having to put overheads and, and, and what have you. The irony is, is if the, the manager's managing assets for a reinsurance company, people are buying a stock. And so consequently, it can be marketed without any kind of regulatory, as long as it complies with uh, Reg D offering for uh, shares in a company uh, sold only to accredited investors. And managing the assets because the reinsurance companies outside of the United States, there's no regulation vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, managing the, uh, the structure. I think the same thing is going to happen for U.S. managers in Europe. The AIFM directive, as it stands, may mean that an awful lot of European assets that U.S. managers are currently managing, uh, they'll no longer be able to manage them or gather new assets without, again, going through tremendous regulatory hoops and structuring and uh, having in, uh, Switzerland is talking about uh, requiring you to actually have human beings on your staff who represent only you in, in Switzerland. And again, most uh, European jurisdictions look at this as you're selling uh, shares in a company to accredited investors and the fact that the managers elsewhere managing the assets of the, as the, of the company uh, appears that uh, that will allow people to continue to access investors from uh, Europe if the climate changes as it is proposed. So Joe, you set up this platform where hedge fund managers can, with your help, set up their own reinsurance company. How has your platform been received so far? We expect to engage one new asset manager per month for the rest of the year and we think ultimately 2014-15 maybe two to four a month and they'll be in all different shapes and sizes uh, even big guys kind of like this thing I mentioned one of them that we've signed up is eight billion because it relieves them of all all the having to do it the, the way that Einhorn Loeb and SAC did where they have to divert a lot of resources and they can learn by doing rather than trying to figure it all out before they jump in the pool. And there's nothing that prevents them from pursuing the startup the old fashioned way in parallel and when they feel they're right they can basically transition over. They've got their own platform so to speak, a lot less expensively. We're pretty optimistic. We've got a good underwriting team. We have a lot of applications to join the underwriting team because they like the concept and like where the business is going. And, you know, it, I think if you, we revisit in a year when people have been booking premium and the, the operating earnings are there and, and we think one will get to the public capital markets by the end of 2013. We, we had a very good meeting yesterday with a, investment bank that uh, the manager is starting with 25 million and we think we'll raise a quarter of a billion by the end of the year if the capital markets are receptive. So I wonder, Joe, geographically, from where is the interest coming from? Most of the interest comes from the greater New York area and London. Some interest in Switzerland because I'm physically here and, and I know a lot of the people, but the London and New York guys have been kind of the leading edge. Uh, the irony is our first manager is based on the west coast of the United States but the next two are New York based and I would say all but two or three of the engagement letters we have out are all either New York or London.